Hello, and welcome to Virtual Abilities 2019 Mental Health Symposium. I'm Larry Laborski, and I have high-functioning autism. I do not have the equipment to speak, so I'll be using a keyboard while I have narrator speak for me. I have been in Second Life for 10 years, and I love the adventures, whether they are created by me or wandering through an adventure created by other residents. I also work in Minecraft as a host for many servers. In real life, I'm a grocery store clerk and have worked at a supermarket for 20 years. Today, I would like to introduce to you Fatima Razai. She is a PhD candidate at Seoul National University. Her research interests are in the area of cyberspace, focusing on the design behind social media, social media platforms that lead to users' obsessive behaviors. Her talk is titled, Designed Addiction. In her talk, she's going to share with us some of the ways that Facebook, Google, and Apple are using attention to gain profit, as well as the psychology of how they and other platforms are exploiting our need for attention via smartphones for monetary gain. Audience, please hold your questions and comments to the end so as not to interrupt our presenter who is very new to the things of Second Life. Welcome, Fatima Renese. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Am I, am I being heard? Doing great. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, I am very excited to be in this virtual conference. And thank you for inviting me. Now we are uh, going to look at this picture, this illustration. Uh, what do you see in it? Yes, everybody, even the baby in the stroller, is looking down on some shiny device. And I'm pretty sure this is a very familiar scene for most of you. And you might have wondered, what is it about these devices that steal everyone's attention? Fatima, do you have your teleprompter on? You want to click the teleprompter. There you go. Yeah. Okay, uh, so an average smartphone user spends 145 minutes on their devices every day, and the number is 255 minutes for heavy users. This data is almost three years old, and I'm pretty sure uh, that these numbers have increased. And you want to keep clicking? On the teleprometer? Yes, please. Yeah, like that? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> you can read it off the screen if you want. Uh, this pie chart shows that services and applications developed by two giant companies, meaning Alphabet and Facebook, get nearly half of all interactions. And there is a correlation between depression and smartphone addiction among both adults and teenagers. As you can see, the more depressed individuals are, the more addicted they are to their devices. And this chart shows that increase in the amount of time spent on electronic devices is also um, increases the suicidal attempts among teenagers. 
need to click quite a bit more. You're, you're way behind. On the I can't, I can't really see my script. You can't yeah. see the text okay. to read? No, wait, wait. Clicking. There you go. Keep clicking. Okay, now I can see it. Sorry, I'm a very, uh, I'm a newbie. Yeah. Yeah, so this is slide. Uh, there's a correlation between depression and smartphone addiction among both adults and teenagers. And as you can see, um, the more depressed individuals are, the more addicted they are to their devices. Researchers have also concluded that heavy usage of smartphone, aside from depression and suicidal thoughts, um, is associated with impaired attention, reduced numerical processing capacity, changes in social cognition, and reduced right prefrontal cortex excitability. Uh, the blue-violet light emitted from phone screens is harmful to eyes, and hunching while staring at phones hurts back neck and shoulders. So how did smartphones become so addictive? Well, Silicon Valley started with good intention and everyone, um, they wanted free and accessible internet for everyone. But to survive, they turn to digital advertising. And that was when the attention economy came into play. Engineers and designers, with the help of psychologists and platforms, because they wanted people to engage as much as possible. So they get to show more advertisements and increase the ad revenue. For example, this is how Facebook looked in 2004. The next year, there's an ad on the left. And this is how it looks like now. There are more ads and sponsored contents than posts from friends and family. And this graph shows how Facebook ad revenue has increased since 2009. Now we are going to look at some responses to this problem from movements, challenges, and publications to apps and dumb phones. Of course, I'm not able to cover all of the responses because recently there have been a lot of them. Uh, in 2013, a former Google employee named Tristan Harris raised his concern about constant attention disturbance and the lack of respect for users' time. He shared his concerns with Google and was promoted to work as a product philosopher, after three years of advocating for a more human, humane approach to technology, Harris left Google. His proposals were not welcomed because his ideas were in conflict with the attention economy business model of the company. Harris founded the non-for-profit organization named Center for Humane Technology, where he continues to raise awareness about the Silicon Valley's attention, attention monopoly. The pioneer of virtual reality, Jaron Lanier, in his book 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, argues the, uh, about the harmful effects of behavior modification caused by social media 
His response to this problem is to urge users to delete their accounts until a humane business model replaces the current attention economy based business model of Silicon Valley. The Royal Society of Public Health in the UK have announced the first scroll free September in 2018, aimed at encouraging young people to take a break at different levels from completely cutting themselves from uh, social media to limiting the use of it to a certain hours for the months of September. And the National Day of Unplugging Movement, a project by the Jewish organization Reboot, distributes a cell phone sleeping bag as a means for stopping smartphone use uh, one day a year. In 2018, they have already uh, sent 35,000 bags to people who want to put their phones to sleep uh, for a day so as to start living a different life. Changing the purpose, purpose and design of the phone itself is another kind of initiative that has been launched to meet the desire in the market for less addictive, overwhelming and distracting phones. Dumb phones, opposed to smartphones, have, communicated, have communication as their core function. Dumb phones are among successful responses that help people minimize distraction while staying connected. Punked MP01, designed by Jasper Morrison, is a phone that only provides the basic function of making and receiving calls, messaging, an alarm clock, and a calendar. Punk sells 100,000 pieces every year and is popular with celebrities. Another phone is the Light Phone by Joe Hollier and Kai Wei Tang as uh, a successful project at initiated on Kickstarter. The Light Phone has two versions, Light Phone 1 with only the capacity to make and receive calls and a second version with added functions such as alarm and texting. However, comparing to iPhone, they are not doing very well in the market. And there are so many apps on the App Store that try to somehow solve the problem of addiction. Now we are going to look at the responses from the creators of the smartphone addiction. In 2016, Donald Trump's presidential campaign, powered mainly by social media, shed light on how easy it is uh, for Facebook and to contribute to mass manipulation and the spread of fake news. The raise of awareness motivated Silicon Valley to act in response to concern regarding smartphone addiction. So on June 2018, Apple added a new feature named the Screen Time in iOS 12 to help reduce the amount of time spent on smartphones. Features include detailed activity reports with, uh, which show the time spent on each app in various categories, the amount of received notifications, and how many times the phone has been unlocked. And the users can choose to limit the usage of certain apps by using time limit feature. Do not disturb mode silences the phone and notifications are not displayed until the mode is turned off. There is also a grayscale feature that takes away the colorful screen of the phone. On, Ju on July 2018, Google announced similar features for Android Pie named Digital Wellbeing. Features are Time Dashboard, App Timer, Do Not Disturb mode, similar to what Apple had. And and wind down that turns the phone display into grayscale, which is easier to find and uh, use than Apple's grayscale feature.
Now we're going to see what is wrong with Silicon Valley's newly added features. The newly developed features by Silicon Valley giants to address the serious problem of smartphone addiction are, uh, are unavailing, inadequate, and possibly harmful. They are unavailing because the addictive and seductive engineering is, is still in place and the business model of the attention economy is still fully intact. All the new well-being features do is return the responsibility to the user by telling them that they are in control of their well-being and that the addiction can be addressed with a little bit of willpower. This approach fails to recognize that a smartphone addiction rewards the brain with dopamine and users cannot easily change their behavior because controlling impulses stimulated by dopamine requires taking major life-changing actions. Silicon Valley's solution to smartphone addiction relies solely on addicts to activate the optional limitations and stick to them through self-discipline, self which users often lack. For Google, Facebook, and Apple, time equals money meaning they have made and continue to make profit through getting people to look at the ads as long as possible. The fact that their entire business model is in conflict with people using their devices less makes the recent attempt to add a screen time feature disingenuous. Timers, self-designated app limits, do not disturb mode, and grayscale mode seems to be the very first and easiest solutions to propose for such a complex issue of addiction. A user who is aware of their smartphone habit is able to modify the phone without the help of such features. For instance, airplane mode or turning off the phone is an alternative to do not disturb mode. The grayscale, <clears throat> the grayscale mode is a tasteless and quick response to making the phone uglier with, uh, while an enormous uh, amount of uh, engineering and design has been dedicated to make the icons, menus, and notifications look as alluring and attractive as possible. Facebook is the largest client of Neurons, a company that measures the electrical activity of the brain while a consumer is interacting with a phone. However, when it comes to tackling the complicated problem of addiction, the easiest and most superficial solutions are implemented. The app limit feature with its constant reminders makes tapping on the ignore limit or modify the limit more of a routine for people who cannot control their impulses. These quick and tasteless responses are harmful because they hinder real conversation and efforts for addressing the core issue of addiction. Smartphone addiction is a serious problem of our time that was created by neglecting the negative aspects of technology in the pursuit of making the, uh, the most profit. Technology is not neutral. All the designs and tools are there to serve a purpose. And in this case, the purpose is to extract as much time and attention from users' life as possible for profit. Deep negative psychological effects of this neglection on the brain and, so and society needs to be profoundly studied before jumping to a self-serving conclusion, proposing shallow solutions, and hoping that things will get better. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Professor. You've given us a lot of insights into a significant problem that exists with smartphones. So I want to start off our questions today. I don't think we consumers should trust those producers to be less addicted to smartphones. Is there anything individuals can do to help themselves? Well, um... Yes, the there are some people, yeah. Don't worry about typing, transcribers will type for you, just talk. Okay, um, some people do a lot of things for themselves, but often it 
doesn't really help because as I said um, it stimulates your brain so you just keep like doing like not using your phone or fo using your phone less for a week or two weeks and then you just give up because your brain is stimulated you have to have a lot of willpower to do that but some people can do like some people they just don't use their smartphone they just use a dumb phone or an old phone or they go regularly on digital detox digital detox is when you um, go to the nature you don't take your phone and you just um, relax for a while so that just refreshes your brain um, but again as long as you have a smartphone in your pocket with all of its function um, it's not going to be an easy challenge I'm going to read some other questions for you. Um, JJ Drinkwater says, do you think we should try and find some other sources of dopamine? Other sources of dopamine? Well, something that uh, is beneficial to you, if it generates dopamine and it's good for you, why not? If it's if it's harmful, it's not okay. And along the same lines, Vanda is asking. She reads books a lot of the time. Is that an addiction? That's not an addiction. That's that's something that is good for your brain. You are gaining knowledge. You are not wasting your time. You are not doing things that has um, no benefits for you. And if you're using your device to read books, that's, that's a great way to use your device. The devices are okay, the devices are not evil. And uh, the platforms that try to draw you back, to try to attract your attention with the small notifications, with all the engineers behind the designs, um, that's what is not good for you. Okay, and Jesse has a comment, but I think I can make a question out of it. Jesse says you should try and stop using your lizard brain. Comes to you. You want to talk about is there is there that you can do like brain training yourself? Train your brain, you know? Did I get the, the question right? Yes, can you train your brain to deal with these addictive properties? Um, you know, like, imagine that the Silicon Valley giants, imagine them as an army with, like, all the weapons and everything the possible that they want to invade your brain, your attention, because that's what makes profit for them. And you alone, you just want to train your brain. I mean, if you are a very strong person, if you exactly know what you're doing, and if you are a professional in training the brain, um, I think that's, that, that can be possible. But you are one man against an army. So, um, I know that many people have tried, but um, not so many people have succeeded to completely gain back their attention. Okay, Amy is saying, he think smartphone, as well as computers, can be used as a tool. Reading the book. Persons with disabilities, these can be invaluable, but it does lend to a dependent as well. Like most, take the good with the bad. So, if you're looking at the phone as a tool, more dependent on it, or addictive. Uh, well, I think I I'm I talked about smartphone a lot in my presentation, but I'm not exactly meaning smartphone because maybe like in five years there will be something else. I don't know. I think the VR is becoming very um, popular. So the device. 
the technology itself is um, not to be blamed, but the platforms and the whole business model of attention economy, that's what, what, what the problem is. If you are using your phone, it's a tool, it's perfect, it, it uh, gives you a lot of power, it empowers you, that's a great tool. But if it's just making you, you less productive, making you depressed, making you compare yourself with others, making you constantly go to Instagram and then compare your life with others, then that kind of negative things should be out of that device because the device is supposed to serve us. We are not supposed to serve the technology. We are not supposed to give their attention to them so that they can make a lot of money and then bring all the advertisers just to sell our attention to them. So the, the technology, the device itself, it's great. Every, like technology, even, even an axe is a technology. You cannot live without technology. But then again, when it's harming us, when it's taking our life, then it should stop somehow. So thinking about one of the things we've said about stopping this problem, more about the cell phone sleeping bags, where would we get those? Actually, um, in like last two years, this this whole topic is very hot. So uh, some people are making money out of it. They they sell these like um, anti addiction, like anti smart smartphone addiction merchandise. So you can just search online and. And the reboot the, um, that I mentioned in my um, presentation, they sell a sleeping bag. It's like more like a campaign. You can buy it, and then there is one day in a year that everyone that has that sleeping bag put the phone inside the bag. But also, you can buy a lot of these like merchandise that kind of try to help you to put your phone away when you don't really need it. Okay, and Roxy is asking, what is the difference between this and our advertising-driven society where ads have historically presented to us everything that can be painted and painted upon? It's, it's very different. It's very different. You go on Facebook, and then whatever you do, you're uh, being watched, like they are tracking your every movement, they know every detail about your personal um, personal life, the things that you like, and then they target that ad to you somehow, and they are like, they're tracking everyone, they are showing these targeted ads that is very different, and then they, they design the whole platform based on the ads because they just want to bring you back to the platform so they they get to show more ads to you which is very different from uh, what you see on TV like commercials in TV or printed ads they do not know what what you like they do not know what you have been eating what you have been searching on Google and um, they just like print ad and then leave it there but the targeted ads, they're like following you everywhere. Okay, now we have a true life story. I would like you to comment on this. Emmy is saying several years ago, she was visiting her parents. And they were watching a news station on television all day. This station kept having a sound like you might hear when a breaking news story would happen but they were playing that sound for almost every story. It was like a Pavlovian effect, and her parents didn't want to leave the station because this important. Scary to what happening. Is there another example of what you're talking about? Yes, that's, that's the same strategy. That's the same psychology that they use to um, just bring back people and get their attention whether it be a sound that people think, oh, something important is happening, because people, they always crave for information. They just want to know things, because that's how we have evolved. And the same thing in the phone, 
the, the notification sound, the, the red, uh, the, the small red thing that you see and you have to tap on it because you don't want to see the red. Uh, you have to check notifications. That's all the same, um, same strategy, same psychology that they use. And Jaden added the acronym F O M O, fear of missing out. Yes. Exactly. Also, the tone of urgency that newscasters use for almost every story. Yeah. Drama, even in newscasts. Okay. Can I have a she says cell phones are so designed now to provide maps, phone, social interaction, and more. It's becoming part of modern life. It's almost a requirement now to keep up, keeping us all addicted in a way. Do you think technology is making our society so addictive that our brains are forgetting to think for themselves? I think that's true. I think that's true. You're always with your phone and, you know, um, I was reading this paper that was talking about, uh, that was uh, saying that uh, how we are not bored anymore. And when you're bored, when you have nothing to do, that's when your brain starts to um, get creative and uh, do interesting things or like have, have some um, reflection on your life. But we are missing all of these small moments because we don't want to like think. We, we don't want to be alone with ourselves. We don't want to spend a minute on uh, an elevator. We just have to look at the phone. So um, I think in the long term, if we do not address it right now, it's going to change us. It's going to change the society. And we will forget how the things were before smartphones. I think we have already forgotten how things before how things used to be before smartphones. And um, I'm not quite sure if that's what we want to do. But the way I see smartphone addiction is like the way London was during the Industrial Revolution. The the air was filled with black smoke, and nobody thought it's harmful until later they found out it's killing them so I think smartphone addiction is like you don't know what's happening but in the future imagine babies like two years old babies they they are using them so just think for yourself what's going to happen in the future if like people don't know how polluted their brain are and how um, difficult for them is to just be alone with themselves even for a moment Well, you're getting a lot of interesting questions here. Um, she found the apps which only work on her phone and not on her computer. She doesn't consider herself addicted. She finds a cell phone difficult to use, but she's on a screen of some sort most of the day because she's homebound and it is her to social interaction. She's assuming here that the ads on computers have the same dopamine impact as those on phones? Now that's a good question. But she says she gets swept into the label of addiction, and it's her option then, if she is, doesn't do this, to sit silently alone in her home with her cat. Mm -hmm. so are the ads on computers the same level of addiction? Computers and phones are slightly different because the phone is small, it's everywhere with you, so you tend to just reach your pocket and, and look at your phone all the time. But if, um, if they're using the computer the same way, and, and she thinks that the computer is like drawing her back with the ads, which I don't think is really the case. I mean, if, I, if she's using Facebook, maybe, but if she's doing other things, um, computers, I think Windows 10 is now like has this notification uh, function that like tells you whatever is happening in your computer, which you can uh, just turn it off. But um, computer as they don't really notify you for the useless things, 
which is a little different. But if the computer is, is helping her, if it's beneficial, I mean, you, you can decide for yourself. If, if it's helping you, if it's empowering you, then you are not addicted. But if it's just like making you miserable, making you depressed, making you constantly compare yourself to others, then uh, maybe she can find other sources of entertainment or other sources of uh, ways that she can spend her time on. Here's another one. This is an observation from Mook. She says, all new well-being features do is return the responsibility to the user. That's what you said. And that is the key point to her. It's the fulcrum point. We can place equally a food addict in front of a 24-7 feast and claim you have taken legitimate steps to tackle their addiction because you've told them the choice fulcrum. These well-being features sound like the minimal token satisfaction conducted from legislation we need for information. Yes, that's a very good uh, observation. Yeah, some people compare smartphone addiction to food addiction and say that um, you cannot live without food and you cannot live without phones. So. Um, if, 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 if a food addict is being told that there, here is a food but you cannot eat, you have to just regulate yourself. And they are doing the same thing for the phones. You, like People are addicted, their, their, their brain is being stimulated and manipulated, but the, 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 these features are saying, hey, there is this um, limit, like app limit feature, you just use it, and then you set a limit for yourself and you can deactivate it anytime you want. I think that's basically the same thing. Observation. She says the fun everywhere is a generational thing. Her kids take their phones out everywhere. We keep it, take her first to church. You think it's a generational issue? Um, yeah, teenagers and, and young people, they use it more, but um, also uh, middle-aged people and elderly, where I live, they are playing Candy Crush all, all day <laughs> uh, on subway. I see what they're doing, I sneak on their phones, which is not a good thing, but it's good for my research. And um, yeah, I see kids and um, teenagers, they use more. And then imagine the, the, the next generation, they are um, living with the phone since they are a kid. And Sonatus says, Humankind lived without these devices for endless years. Have we changed so fast, a few decades, or was there something or some things in human cultural life prior to this that functioned the same way as these phones, in the sense of fulfilling something missing or thought to be in our lives? Anything like in human history? Humans, they, they love uh, to be loved, they love to make connections, and they, uh, they crave for information. And as I said, that's how we have survived, because knowledge empowers us, and we crave for more information and more information, and we want to uh, relate to people, we want to connect to them, and that's what these phones are apparently, on a superficial level, are providing. And our brain is not able to distinguish between what is a real connection, what is uh, the information that is um, that is correct, that is like worth my time to spend on it and read it, or um, the people like you have so many friends on these platforms, but are they really your friends? 
how, how many of them you can count as being your true friend. We want to have a lot of friends, we want to be popular, we want to be appreciated. These are like um, basic and very natural human needs. And these platforms, they actually took advantage of these needs and they turned it to a money-making machine. I don't know if this is a question you feel you can answer or not, but I will ask it. Um, he says he spent five hours, I think he means a day, five hours a day on Second Life. Is that considered ill usage of Second Life? I don't know if you can answer that. It depends on you. How do you feel about it? <gasps> Well, if you feel great, then that's great. So many people don't feel great when they spend time on, on Instagram or, or they waste their time on some games. They don't feel great and they want it to stop, but they cannot stop it because it's addictive. And Roxy asks if you think cell phone addiction is dumbing down the population. Well, there are, um, this is a very new issue. As I said, like, it's like very hot and nobody knows what's happening exactly. So they have started to do some research, especially on the kids and how the screen time is affecting their brands. And they have found that Kids who are exposed to screens and phones and, and iPads, they are learning slightly slower than their than the kids who are just like playing around and not using the devices as much. So it's definitely having some effect on the brain. And um, we are going to see what's hap what's going to happen in the future. But my personal opinion is yes, it's it's dumbing us down. Smartphones and dumb people. That's what I think. Wow, that's like a bumper sticker. Smartphones and dumb people. <laughs> Roxy, when you say you mean over all life skills, I'm not sure what, what you mean by that. Amy says, um, in response to that, she wondered in some way whose phones are making us stupid. She does. We're dependent on them, similar to a calculator. If you use a calculator all the time, you become dependent and forget how to do math without it. So Amy thinks that it is making us stupid. Yeah, like before smartphones or before, before phones, we used to like memorize um, so many numbers, I don't know if you remember, like memorize your friends' numbers, your relative numbers, and you knew how to navigate, which you don't probably know now. So we are losing these skills, but um, I don't really know if like losing these skills necessarily makes us more stupid, because we can, we can use our brains in some other fields. But again, it's it's not very clear what's what these devices and these like comfort is doing to us. And iSky is pointing out that people no longer use slide rules. It's an old technology. It was useful back in the old days before there were calculators. But you know, maybe this is just a new kind of technology. Is that a question? Sorry, I, di I didn't get it. No, I'm not sure it was a question. Shyla has a question. She's heard you twice suggest that if the user is happy or empowered, they are not addicted. If addiction is self-defined, why are so many not aware that walking down the street and into a wall might indicate over-attachment? Hmm. Well, I don't really know how to answer that. Like, 
uh, you have to go and talk to those, those people who are endangering themselves by being over attached. That's definitely dangerous. And if something happens to them, they're not going to be happy about their habits, their harmful behavior. But and what I mean by uh, if you feel empowered, because so many people are not feeling so great about these devices, but they do not know how to stop it. They, they want to have a way, they, they want to have some devices that are serving them, but they don't have any alternative. They just have smartphones and all these giant companies, as I mentioned, Alphabet and Facebook, and they just have to use these, these services and they don't want to do it. Okay, and iSky said that the thing is, when technology fails, like there are some forms that knock out uh, the technology, do we know how to use fallback to keep going? That's something I think that, no, <laughs> not in, not in a lot of places, maybe in, in some places that they have to keep going, like they have some backup plans, but for the society as a whole, I think no. And it's, it's a real danger, like, um, if some, yeah, some sunstorm just blow everything up, then we are going to go back to the Stone Age, probably. Okay, let me get this pasted in. Paste. There we go. Okay, Carrie asks, do you think we have to accept that we live in a digital panopticon where we are watched from all sides, and although we wish to protect our privacy to be able to use some of the tech to live in the modern world, we have to sell a bit of our soul or the result of our account? There's always an alternative um, business model to, to this chaos. They don't really have to use our soul or our attention to provide us with services that make life easier for us. Um, uh, if you remember, I mentioned attention economy, and um, there is this other business model which is called efficiency economy. and. It's basically a subscription-based model that you pay for the service. You don't pay with your attention. You pay with the service and then, then use it. And that just makes you even like more cautious about what you are buying because that's real money. So you pay to a company and then they use, use the service that they provide. And um, you don't really have this much uh, problem of uh, companies trying to compete for your attention because you've already paid. And you are using the service. But the thing is, the efficiency economy also has its own problem. Um, it kind of like centralizes um, the whole, the whole, um, it just kills the competition because the big, big companies, the already giant companies, they are going to get um, most of the subscriptions and then others will die in the competition. It has also its own sort of problems and um, it's not clear if it's going to work, but then there are alternatives in that we don't have to sell our souls. It's just a matter of profit, like which one makes the more profit for these companies. And Eric has asked an extensive question here. What are your thoughts on the additional risks and rewards of augmented reality? Not just by using a smartphone screen to see the world in a different way, but also the rise of augmented reality headsets and glasses that may eventually be more common. I think that's going to make the world a very weird place. 
that living together and public space has no meaning anymore. Even now, you go anywhere, you see people in their own world. They do not share the same world. And with that AR, it's going to be even worse. That's what I think. But I cannot predict how, how the society is going to look like if everyone is using those devices. And Dayton says, bubble worlds. Yes. And, and the bubble world, as I said, everyone is living in their own world. And the world is designed for them because if they're using the phones and these platforms, everything is designed for them. Like if you go to Instagram on the Explore page, that page is just designed for you. And no one has the same page. You see the things that you want to see. You don't know what other people are thinking and like what kind of issues exist for others. So you're going deeper into your bubble. Some dire predictions here. And Eric says bubbles already exist. Yes. I think we have time for one last question if somebody would like to ask one. I know we've asked you a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm more than happy to answer. Okay, Shia's got the last question here. Cell phones are of business people to her. Do corporations overly encourage their employees to own and use cell phones? Are the corporations responsible too? Corporations are encouraging people to use, to own a cell phone. Yes, yes, that's, that's, a, that's also a problem. That's also a problem. And um, when you have a smartphone, everyone expects you to be available all the time. So uh, they just send you a work-related email, I don't know, 2 a.m. or um, early in the morning, and then you're constantly in this stress of work, and everybody expects you to be available all the time. And... I think they are responsible too, but um, there are some cases, uh, I think in France, that um, they uh, made it illegal for, for the corporates and companies to send um, work-related email after the working hour. So there are some, some um, things happening, some, some companies, they already know how bad it is for the employees to be uh, all the time available, but yeah, definitely they are also to be blamed. Everyone, I think, um, we all expect our, our friends to reply to the text like within two minutes. If they don't, we are just gonna be like, why? What's wrong with that person? Why they're ignoring us? But before all of these, we had um, a phone, I don't know how to call it, like a cable phone, a, a stationary phone that um, people used to call us or like send us letters and then uh, we just didn't have that expectation but now everyone in the work in, in university everywhere they expect everyone to be available all the time and that's a part of the problem too I think we're going to need to let Ms. <laughs> Rusty rest She's responding to a lot of questions here, so I'm going to ask our audience to thank you for sharing your and your results. And I think it gives me a lot of pause, and maybe I'm really glad I do not own a cell phone, because I live in a part of the United States where there is no coverage. You don't have a cell phone, Gentle? No, I do not have a cell phone. There's no That's coverage. Amazing. 
but I cannot receive or send any cell phone messages. <laughs> How do you feel about that? I'm fine with it. I have a landline. Yeah, you can live like that. You don't need it. You don't need to be responding to everyone all the time. Well, I'm also retired medical. So. <laughs> I'm the last person on earth to be zombified, Luke says. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks ago, I I, I changed. Um, I I got an, uh, another phone. It's um, it's a new series by Nokia. It's like nostalgia series, I think. That they they make the old phones the way they were. Um, I got one of those, and I'm I've been using that for my research purpose, and it's been great. Like I told my close friends that look, I'm not gonna be on these like apps like whatsapp or we have here cacao talk i'm not gonna re reply to you instantly i will check once a day and that's been working for me great i have a lot of time to do things that i enjoy not just like looking at the screen at the black mirror that's what the, the serious name is So thank you, thank you, Ms. Rizzi. This was really, really good. You've given us a lot. It was, it was my honor to be here. Thank you. For our audience's sake, if you have not heard, unfortunately, Dr. Shakir, he is a medical doctor at a hospital. He had a real life emergency and he can't be with us today. We're definitely going to invite him back because his message is too important for us not to hear it. So stay tuned for when we will get him to come back. He has done some research that indicates that the teenagers with social media do not understand when they're being bullied. That's, I think, really important. So instead of having Dr. Shakir with us, we're going to have a social hour, which is a time to mix and mingle, and get to know other people here at the conference who have similar interests in social media, virtual worlds, and mental health. If um, Ms. Rosé can stay, we can ask her some questions. I see some of our other presenters are here. Uh, but first, what I'd like to do is I'd like to thank all the people who have made this conference such a wonderful conference. I'm thrilled with it. Uh, first of all, we've got a conference team that has been invaluable. I want to recognize Luke Cooler and iSky Silverweb. They've spent long months helping prepare and then run this conference. And I usually do let that conference team take a week off once we've got the conference wrap up work done before we start planning for the International Disability Rights Affirmation Conference, IDRAC, which comes in the fall. So you're going to want to be looking for that. I also want to give special recognition to the community members who were here to introduce the conference speakers. That would be Linda starting off this morning, Batsai, Moose, Les, Maile, and Larry. They deserve recognition. We also have a bunch of community members who greeted the audience as they came into the auditorium. And that would be Carla, DR42, Phoenix, Isabella, Lauren, Vulcan, Luzona, Leandra, Mrs. Dai, Gemma, Leandra, Ty, Sonatus, and Vivi. I'm going to recognize Emmy Capolini. She handles the SIM maintenance and security, and she's also assisted some of our speakers with personalization of their avatars, which is a very significant thing to do. I want to recognize Pecos and Orange and Sue Ellen and Alex who worked on the social media presence as limited as it is. We can always use help. No, we're not going to Disneyland. Wouldn't that be wonderful? There is a Disneyland maybe in second mode. We have a great video team working today. That would be Petlov and Marcus and Joey. They've done a lot of setup work and they've been here all day. We have fantastic transcribers who increase the accessibility of our conference for people who are unable to hear. 
And that would be Lori Baum and Carolyn and Electra. Electra's been up way late. Please, please go ice your wrists, ladies. And of course, the most important people at the conference are the audience members. And I want to thank them for their interest in mental health and how it can be supported in a virtual setting. And now I would invite everyone to adjourn from the formal part of this conference and let's head outside the auditorium for the social hour. You can mix and mingle with our presenters and the others who are at the conference. <laughs>